Hello, everyone. So uh, it's been a while since I've talked about Jordan Peterson, and uh, to my knowledge, I've never talked about Dan Crenshaw. Uh, but that is going to change today uh, because I just saw this video on my Twitter feed uh, wherein Jordan Peterson and Dan Crenshaw are discussing economic inequality uh, on Jordan Peterson's podcast. Uh, and this video was not good. Um, it was very bad. And so I thought I would just sit down and take a few minutes to um, address the points being made here. Um, so anyways, uh, yeah, let's just get into it. It is the inequality in some sense that bothers people, but with regards to the leftist policies is that they actually underestimate the severity of the problem of inequality. And they assume that restructuring capitalism would remove inequality. And there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that that has ever worked in any way other than the opposite, because inequality is not a consequence of capitalism. It looks like it's almost like a physical property of reality itself. There are physicists who model the unequal distribution of money using the same equations they use to describe the dispersion of gas into a new environment. Like, it's a really something fundamental. It can't be overstated. And it's a real problem, right? Because who the hell wants terribly poor people? Like, that's such a catastrophe. But it's not like it's a consequence of capitalism. It's like, well, come on, the, guys. The, the other thing about inequality... Okay, so that's the first point I wanted to address. So if I understand Jordan Peterson's argument correctly, he's basically saying that policies, leftist policies that are aimed at combating economic inequality by modifying or restructuring or going beyond capitalism, so things such as increased social spending, uh, encouraging union membership, um, redistributing capital, etc., uh, these policies are fundamentally misguided because their advocates assume that inequality is a product of capitalism, but in fact, inequality is not a product of capitalism. And we know that inequality is not a product of capitalism because we can see all sorts of different contexts and different systems wherein inequality emerges uh, that seemingly have nothing to do with capitalism. And in addition to that, he makes this other argument, which is that basically just as a historical, empirical matter, there's no evidence whatsoever that any of these policies have ever or could ever uh, uh, meaningfully uh, reduce uh, the extent of inequality in society. So what are the problems with this? Well, firstly, um, Peterson is correct that inequality isn't a product of capitalism in the sense that capitalism isn't the only structure or context under which inequality exists or would exist. Uh, but people who criticize capitalism on the basis of inequality or propose modifications to capitalism or alternative systems to deal with that problem uh, don't need to hold that capitalism is the only structure or context that creates inequality. They would just need to make the case that capitalism is a structure which creates some degree of inequality, and that there are alternative structures or modifications to that structure that wouldn't create inequality to as high a degree. Uh, so, to put the issue more clearly, Imagine we have two alternative systems. We have system A and we have system B. And then we have some variable, uh, we'll call it X. And we generally take X to be a bad thing. If I say that X gives us reason to favor system A over system B, all that needs to be true in order for that argument to work is that X would exist to a greater extent in system B than in system A. It does not need to be the case that the only system X would exist in is system B. So obviously, uh, Peterson's point that inequality doesn't just exist under capitalism doesn't work as a response to arguments from inequality or to people who are proposing policies to deal with inequality. Uh, but he also says that there's no evidence that any of these policies or institutions can lower the degree of inequality. Uh, this is more defensible on purely rational grounds because it's not just a straightforward logical error like his last claim. 
Uh, but the problem is that this is just a completely false empirical claim. Uh, so I don't want to spend too much time on the empirics because I already went over some of this in an earlier response to Jordan Peterson, uh, but it's worth keeping a few things in mind. Um, for one, we actually can uh, examine the correlation uh, among OECD countries between income inequality reduction and public social spending. And when we do this, the R-square correlation between these two variables is 0.69, which is obviously highly significant. So it does seem to be the case that as countries engage in higher levels of social spending, um, they're more likely to see lower degrees of inequality. But even if we want to go beyond just sort of raw cross-country correlational data and look at more detailed studies, um, here's a study titled Social Spending Generosity and Income Inequality, a, a Dynamic Panel Approach. This was from the Institute of Labor Economics. Um, I obviously can't cover any of these studies in their entirety uh, in this video, um, so I'll link them in the description if anyone wants to take a closer look. Uh, but I'll just read a quick excerpt from the abstract. Um, the regression results suggest that more social spending effectively reduces inequality levels. The result is robust with respect to the instrument count and different data restrictions. Um, and we can go beyond just social spending as well and look at other things, such as union membership. So there's this very helpful graph from the Economic Policy Institute, which basically shows that over the history of the United States, as union membership declines, income inequality increases. Uh, so there's a pretty stark, uh, there's a pretty stark um, correlation here between the share of income going to the top 10% of society on the one hand and union membership on the other hand. So we can see um, as uh, union membership throughout the 80s took a sharp decline, um, the share of income going to the top percent, to the top 10 percent in the U.S. Um, sharply increased at the same time. Um, but again, going beyond just raw correlations, um, here is a, a more detailed study. It's titled Unions and Inequality Over the 20th Century, New Evidence from Survey Data. This is from the National Bureau of Economics Research. Um, and again, I'll just read a quick excerpt from the abstract. Using distributional decompositions, time series regressions, state year regressions, as well as a new instrumental variable strategy based on the 1935 legalization of unions and the World War II era War Labor Board, we find consistent evidence that unions reduce inequality, uh, explaining a significant share of the dramatic fall in inequality between the mid-1930s and the late 1940s. Um, here's another paper. This was a research note um, titled Unions and Income Inequality, a, Pana, a Panel Co-Integration and Causality Analysis from the United States. Sorry, my microphone is like in front of my screen, so it's like fucking up my reading. Um, but anyways, the abstract says, in this research note, it is shown that by applying co-integration and causality techniques to U.S. state-level panel data, there is a negative long-run relationship between unionization and income inequality in the United States, and that causality is unidirectional from unionization to inequality. So, uh, and so this last part just means that not only is there a correlation between, uh, uh, unionization and lower levels of inequality, but we actually know the direction of the causality. We know that it is more unionization that causes lower degrees of inequality. So um, the point here is that Jordan Peterson is basically just flatly wrong, right? There is a large body of empirical research suggesting that there are various um, uh, leftist policies and institutions which have been found to meaningfully reduce the amount of economic inequality in society. Audie, let's look at the following math problem. If you and I are the, the sole citizens of country X, you make $50,000 a year and I make $100,000 a year, well, there's a delta between us of $50,000. Now, let's both double our income. Now, you make $100,000 and I make $200,000. Well, holy crap, inequality just doubled because now there's the $100,000 delta. So it's just not always what people think. Like, I don't okay, so this was a very strange point um, because he says, like, oh, well, look, in the second case I described, um, inequality went up 
relative to the first case that I described, and that sort of demonstrates the absurdity of caring about inequality. Um, but based on roughly any uh, measure that's actually used to measure economic inequality, um, economic inequality actually did not go up. Uh, in fact, inequality would be exactly the same in uh, in both scenarios that he described, right? Because he says like, oh, well, look, in the second scenario, the delta in raw dollar amounts between what I have and what you have is bigger. But inequality is not measured with respect to how many more dollars some people make uh, compared to other people. Inequality is measured with respect to something like, um, if you want to take the Gini coefficient, for example, which is probably the most common way of measuring inequality, um, inequality is a function of what percentage of the total income different segments of the population possess, right? And in Crenshaw's examples, inequality is exactly the same in both cases, because in both cases, both parties have the exact same percentage of the total amount of money in question, right? So I just take it that Crenshaw is equivocating when he talks about inequality, because he says, oh, how absurd is it to... Um, care about inequality, but then when he describes what he means by inequality, he means something different uh, from what leftists mean and what everyone else means when they're talking about and analyzing inequality. I don't care that there's a lot of people who are way, way wealthier than me. It doesn't necessarily bother me. What would bother me is if I have no chance of ever being them. If I was the most talented, smartest person on the planet, it would bother me if I had no chance of ever being that person. I'm sorry, but that's just not the world we live in. If we look at what keeps you out of poverty, and, and I think this is from the Brookings Institute, there's like three things. It's like finish high school, have a job, any job, and don't have kids before you're married, and you've got like a 97% chance of not being in poverty. So it turns out we do live in a society where choices matter and the value that you provide matters. And that's the society we want to live in. Is it perfect? No. Is it the best we can do? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. And should we have a safety net for those who just can't make it? Yeah, yeah, there should be a safety net. Okay, so a few points there. So Crenshaw says, it doesn't bother me if some people make way more than me. All that would bother me is if I have no, tra uh, no chance of ever being them. Uh, so... Firstly, I would just say that I think there are several reasons why inequality itself can be thought of as objectionable. So for one, I could just appeal to utilitarian considerations and the diminishing marginal utility of income. The basic idea behind the diminishing marginal utility of income is that as I get richer, the amount, uh, the extent to which I benefit from each additional dollar that I earn is going to decrease. And that is because as I get richer, uh, each additional dollar that I earn is going to um, satisfy less and less urgent needs that I have. Uh, and so this is fairly intuitive, right? So if I give an extra $1,000 a month to um, like a poor, impoverished, struggling family, that might mean the difference between living a deeply impoverished existence on the one hand and living a relatively comfortable existence on the other hand. Uh, whereas if I give an extra $1,000 a month to Jeff Bezos, um, that's not even pocket change, right? Like, like he, that's not even a noticeable difference to him because he already has so much money. Um, and so the point is just that if we have an economic system that distributes economic resources in a way uh, which is highly unequal, then we have an economic system that's giving large amounts of excess resources to certain people when those resources could have contributed to more well-being if they were given to people who had less, right? And so insofar as we are concerned with having an economic system that distributes resources in such a way that maximizes human happiness and human flourishing, we should uh, oppose any economic system that distributes resources that unequally. Um, in addition to that, there are just broader negative effects associated with economic inequality. So, for example, higher levels of economic inequality tend to increase crime rates. Um, this is for at least two reasons. For one, um, as inequality increases, this causes a lot of social unrest because then people on the bottom end of that distribution feel as though they are being disadvantaged in order for other people to benefit. Uh, and that makes people more likely to commit crimes. 
Um, in addition, as inequality increases, the expected economic returns on committing crimes becomes higher. So to make that point more intuitive, the richer you are compared to me, the more I benefit from going over to your house and robbing you, right? In addition to that, uh, uh, in addition to crime rates, um, it seems as though uh, higher levels of economic inequality is actually detrimental to economic growth. Uh, this has been found repeatedly by the International Monetary Fund and the OECD. Um, this is, for again, for at least two reasons. The main reason is because as inequality grows, uh, or the higher inequality is, the more people on the bottom end, uh, or the harder it becomes for people on the bottom end of that distribution to access things like quality health care and quality education um, and diverse social networks and so on. And all of these things are very important for people uh, developing, uh, having the ability to develop their human capital and become productive members of society. And so the more inequality there is, the less people have an opportunity to become productive members of society and the less productive society becomes, right? Um, and in addition to that, as I said earlier, economic inequality drives up social unrest and political instability, and countries with higher levels of social unrest and political instability are less attractive to investors, and obviously a country being able to attract investment is very important for that country's economic growth rate, uh, and so more equal countries have an advantage in that respect. Um, but then there are also just more fundamental moral concerns. Uh, I personally would appeal to a principle called luck egalitarianism. Uh, what luck egalitarianism means is that it is unjust for some people to be worse off compared to other people in virtue of factors that they had no control over. Um, in other words, it is bad for some people to benefit from things that are morally arbitrary because they don't reflect any decisions that they've made when other people get less as a result. Uh, because I'm a luck egalitarian, I believe that in order for society to be just, it has to meet, uh, it has to satisfy a principle that the political philosopher G. A. Cohen calls socialist equality of opportunity. Uh, socialist equality of opportunity, roughly speaking, means that uh, as a matter of distributive justice, inequalities should only be allowed to exist when they reflect different decisions uh, on the behalf of the parties involved, right? So, for example, um, if you make more money than me, but you make more money than me purely because even though we both had an equal opportunity to earn the same amount of money, I chose to um, work less uh, so that I could have more leisure time, whereas you chose to sacrifice some of your leisure time so that you could work more and earn more money, uh, then in that case, it's not unjust that you end up with more take-home pay than I do, right? Because it's just the only reason you have more money is because we made different decisions. Um, but obviously, uh, the vast majority of inequality which is produced by a capitalist system is not going to be justified on the basis of socialist equality of opportunity. Um, because by and large, un under a capitalist system, people are able to earn more money and have get more power uh, at the expense of other people in virtue of all kinds of factors that don't reflect any decisions that they've made. For example, generally speaking, you're going to earn more money if, you, um, uh, if you're more intelligent, if you have a better skill set, if, if you were born into a better class position, if you were just presented with uh, better opportunities than other people were presented with, etc. Um, and so... That sort of view, the luck egalitarian view that I've outlined, would condemn capitalism and would support um, policies which are aimed at, you know, redistributing wealth and income and so on. Um, now, and it seems like Dan Crenshaw partially conceded to a view like that when he says that, well, okay, it would bother me if I have no chance uh, of ever being as well off as somebody else. 
Uh, but my question would be, why should we set the bar so high that we only care if we have zero chance of being as well off as other people, right? Shouldn't it also be objectionable if we simply have a somewhat lower chance of being as well off as someone else because of factors that are outside of their control uh, or outside of our control? Uh, so for example, right? If we had a society wherein if you're born with the wrong skin color, you're like 10% less likely to earn as much money as everyone else, surely that would still be unjust and morally objectionable, even though there's still some chance uh, of you being able to earn as much as everyone else, even if you're born that skin color. Um, so I would just say, right, like, in order for society to be just, why should our chances for flourishing be impacted to any degree by factors that are outside of our control, right? Um, so that's just the question that I would pose to Dan Crenshaw. And the problem for Dan Crenshaw is that if he concedes to that point, then he can no longer defend capitalism. But it's very hard to see how he could reasonably resist that point. Um, okay, so yeah. Uh, and then in addition to that, um, he brings up the success sequence where he basically says, look, according to the Brookings Institute, you're like 97% less likely to end up in poverty if you do these three things. Those three things being finish high school, get a job, and don't have kids out of wedlock. Um, and that's true, but one problem with this, and Matt Brunig has done a lot of good work on this, uh, and I'll link that in the description. And what he's shown is that, like, yes, it is true that if you do those three things, uh, you're 97% less likely to end up in poverty. But if you take out the second two things and just look at getting a job by itself, the reduction in your chances um, of ending up in poverty is basically exactly the same as when you include those other two things, right? So it's true that if you get a job plus doing those other two things, you'll be significantly less likely to end up in poverty, but that's just because it's true that if you got a job plus did any other two random things, you're also going to be significantly less likely to wind up in poverty, right? It would be analogous to if I said like, hey, did you know that if you worked out every day and also carried around little stones in your pocket, and also wore a gray sweatshirt every Thursday, you're going to end up being significantly more likely to develop your physical strength, right? And people would react to that by being like, well, yeah, but that's just because the working out part is what's doing all the heavy lifting there. Um, and, you know, the other two things are just irrelevant. You could substitute those two things for any other two things, and the effect would remain the same. Uh, and it's the same thing with the with the success sequence. Um, but the other problem is that even if everyone who could have jobs did get a job, there would still be a lot of inequality for at least three reasons. The first reason is that roughly 50% of our population uh, are people who, due to their circumstances, cannot enter the labor force. So this category includes people like disabled people, children, the elderly, caretakers, uh, and students, right? And so just saying like, oh, well, inequality wouldn't be as big of a problem uh, if everyone just got a job, that's not very helpful when one of the main reasons for inequality being as high as it is, is that like half of all people can't get a job because of the circumstances that they're in. Um, and in addition to that, even if everybody did get a job, there's still going to be a lot of inequality because uh, there's a lot of inequality with respect to uh, the wages that different groups of workers earn. And in addition to that, even if everyone did have a job and even if everyone uh, earned the same amount of money in terms of their wages, uh, labor income is not the only source of income in a capitalist economy. Basically, one-third of all income that's produced by a capitalist economy is capital income, i.e. income that just flows passively to some people in virtue of them owning capital. Um, and so there, there's still going to be a lot of inequality uh, due to inequality in capital ownership as well. Um, so yeah, just just saying like, oh, people should just get jobs. That basic that does basically um, nothing to meaningfully address the problem of inequality. Um, 
Okay, so yeah, that's basically it. Um, now that we're at the end of the video, I want to give an obligatory $10, uh, fuck, I want to give an obligatory shout out to my $10 patrons, that being Eloy Points, Eduardo Squidwardo, Raven, Benny G, SJEW Nelson, Alex Monzoni, Alexander Adams, Liam Offer, Isocratic, Julius Conan, Sleepy Snacks, Cold a Science Dude, Red Flare 31, uh, and, uh, that's it. Um... Yeah, if you're interested in supporting me, I'll link my Patreon in the description of this video. I try to upload semi-frequent uh, Patreon-exclusive articles um, about the same kinds of subjects that I talk about on this channel. Um, if you're not interested in supporting me, that's equally fine. Thanks for watching this video anyways. I hope you learned something from it or benefited in some way. Uh, otherwise, I apologize for stealing like 20 minutes of your time. Um, shit, forget if, I can't remember if I'm forgetting something. Oh, also, um, I'll link my Discord in the description below because people have been telling me to advertise that more. Um, so yeah, um, anyways, uh, peace out.